This is one of my favorite topics because it has been life-changing for me and it was deeply life-changing for my husband. So we're talking about temperaments tonight and this is a tool for you that will help you in every area of your life once you get a handle on it and begin to recognize parts of yourself that you didn't want to accept or that you didn't like or that is in conflict with another part of yourself. You know, those internal struggles that we sometimes have where part of us wants this and the rest of us wants that and there's this kind of this internal clash. Once you recognize and understand your temperament blend, you can begin to validate the parts of yourself that you may have been rejecting all of your life and or with other relationships that they can irritate you, but once you understand the temperament behind it, then you realize it is truly God-given that that person is the way that they are. And I know that may sound funny, and, and, the, and the big difference too is that we can be walking in our strengths and our weaknesses, but as we develop and mature in Christ, our weaknesses begin to get tempered. And our weaknesses don't show up as much when we're congruent with ourselves, when we are accepting ourselves as we are and as God made us. So it's absolutely fascinating to me, and I've been talking about this since 1980, 1978, something like that. But for my husband, because of his temperament blend, he literally said had he not learned about his temperament, he would have killed himself because there was this part of himself that he hated so much that he came to love about himself when he understood the dynamics that were within him and he got them working with each other rather than rejecting you know when we're rejecting ourselves we may be rejecting a God-given part of ourselves just because we don't like it or it doesn't seem to fit what we want or what we think we should be it's been fascinating to me as I've gone along in this journey because for me, I was raised with a mask. I wore the sanguine mask. We're going to talk about the temperaments in a moment so you can get each one specifically. But each of us is given a role in the, in the home, uh, the hierarchy of the home. And so if you were raised to follow a certain pattern that was kind of served up to you and that wasn't lined up with your temperament, you may do it to your own peril in the long run. Because I was raised to be uh, under the radar, don't, don't upset anyone, always be joyful and happy, don't cause any problems, and so anything that I had that was contrary to that, I had to internalize it. Ignore it, shelf it, pretend it wasn't there. And the sad thing is I began to believe, or I did believe, that that's who I was. So when I first took the temperament test, I put myself as a real strong sanguine. I'm 10% sanguine. So you can see there was a huge conflict going on within me because it didn't line up with my God-given temperament. So it's so critical. You're not going to like the weaknesses. None of us do, but every temperament has certain weaknesses. Those will become less and less, and you can even begin to turn them into strengths when you recognize what's in operation. I'm not going to tell you I still don't have some of the weaknesses. I'll talk about those when we get to it. But it's <laughs> then you recognize, okay, that's built into me. What can I do to minimize it or to cause... You know, a lot of it is bringing it before the Lord. Lord, you made me this way. Now, help me to help to make it work for me in, in whatever you've called me to do and be in my life. So, we all have people that irritate us, that we would rather not be around. And when I go through this, you're going to recognize that's what you're noting in certain people. That they can just, they, you know, you almost feel like you don't want to be around them. Or you do feel like you don't want to be around them. So, I want to share a, 
a little bit of a story with you before I go any further because this kind of exemplifies how each of the temperaments responds differently to certain situations. And that's very, very true, isn't it, April? Each, mm -hmm. of, the, each of the temperaments, and depending on what your blend is, you're going to react differently in different situations. So my husband said to me, this is many years ago now, but he said to me, you're going to go to town today, so would you pick me up some, I thought he said jock itch, would you pick me up some jock itch? So, yeah, I know. So I walked into the pharmacy, and I'm looking at, in the men's, you know, just looking, trying to find jock itch on the show. And the pharmacist, the pharmacist finally says to me, may I help you? And I said, yeah, do you have jock itch? <laughs> and again, different temperaments respond differently. This is a product for jock itch. I don't even know if this product is around anymore, but it says it cures jock itch. So this is Truex for jock itch. Can you imagine that man's mind? Depending on his temperament, when I said that, do you have jock itch? A woman would not say that to someone, right? Well, I did. And because of his temperament, I'll just put that there as a little visual. <laughs> Lovely. Because of his temperament, he responded to me like this. <clears throat> kind of blinked. He said, you, just, you could see his wheels turning for just a split second. And then he said, do you mean uh, for jock itch, medication for jock itch, like Cruex? <laughs> and I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> totally embarrassed. But yes, that's what I meant. So his temperament, he could, have, he could have reacted a lot of different ways. His temperament was shown in his reaction. He didn't degrade me or laugh at me. You know, a sand one would have just burst out laughing. That's how they would have reacted to that. <laughs> and a choleric would have been corrective, you know, in a... Not a nice, necessarily nice, smooth way. This guy was very nice about it. And he was able to solve what I really meant without embarrassing himself more or me more or whatever. So depending on the temperament of the people that were most around, they're going to give different responses in different situations. And I'm going to try, going to try and give you an idea of that with each of these as we go through them. So when you went through your temperament quiz, which was this paper, you, in the first section, this is the Sanguine section, S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. Some people say Sanguine, I say Sanguine, I'm not sure which is correct to tell you the complete truth. The second one on your list is the melancholy temperament. A lot of people think of that and they immediately think of depressed. And actually, they're, they're quite accurate on that. The third one, again, pronunciation here, choleric is how I pronounce it. Some people pronounce it choleric, which is correct. I am not sure. And then the last of the four, we'll go through each of these individually in just a moment, is the phlegmatic. And if you look up phlegmatic in the dictionary, it says phlegm in the throat. <laughs> That's like, ooh, have to think about that a little bit. But I want you to keep in mind that we're all a blend of at least three. Jesus was a blend of all four. We generally are going to have a major, a little bit less major, and then a minor. And so in my temperament, it took me a while to, to get my, my percentages correct because I had trouble being honest with myself. Because there were certain things I just didn't, flat out didn't like about what it said about what I was, my temperament was. So you, you're probably going to go through that a little bit yourself. But helping... 
and allowing each part of you to develop. See, what we've done when we didn't understand is we've stunted our own growth on the parts that we've rejected because we didn't understand what we were doing. It's literally just out of ignorance. Nothing we did intentionally. And it could be uh, patterning that we got as we were growing up, as I said, for my situation. But once you've developed your strengths and your functioning in those, that brings great contentment and joy. And it also brings self-confidence. Because now you know you're walking in what God made you to be. Otherwise, you end up with this internal wrestling match. Anyone ever had that happen? Where you're just kind of fighting within yourself and you can't come to a decision because you don't know this side wants that, this side wants that, that kind of thing. And that isn't healthy. It's stressful. It's very stressful. So once you've learned your weaknesses and your strengths and working congruently with yourself, then everything begins to feel more content, calmer. I'm going to turn this down just a little because I think it's a little bit loud for... Okay. So that's what I call temperament in conflict. When you don't understand your temperament and you're having these wrestling matches with yourself and or people in your family because you don't understand their temperament. And what that does is it's a lot of energy wasted, and it's also a matter of respect. You're not, because you don't know your temperament, you're not able to respect. This is this part of me, and this is this part of me. It's all me, it's all one, but it's hard to respect things about yourself that you really resent. But once you recognize those are things that were built into you, then your level of self-respect goes up which is absolutely fascinating. So your weaknesses can and will be tempered as you understand the dynamics. And one of the things I like to say that really, I, it was hard for me to learn this, really hard for me to learn this. Let yourself be. Don't pick on yourself all the time. You don't do this or you don't do that right. You, how are you going to flow in your giftedness and the beauty of who you are when you're constantly second-guessing yourself on everything? So when you come to one of those conflicts, what you need, need to do is have a little get-together with your temperaments. This part wants this. This part wants that. How can both be satisfied? Because very often that argumentative one just is not being heard. So it raises its head as an ugly because you're, you haven't respected that part of yourself. You constantly are, no, 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 shoving it in the corner. And so then you end up with this negative response where you're having actually a wrestling match inside of yourself. So let yourself be. You know, have you ever said to someone, just leave me alone? Just leave me alone. What you're saying is, let me be. Just let me be. But do you let you be? That's the big question. Do you let yourself just be? And the answer is probably often not, or at least a share, a good share, because you have an understand temperaments. So the first one we're going to talk about tonight is the sanguine, or the sanguine. So I'm going to actually go through the list of strengths and weaknesses, because the people on video don't have this list in front of them. But... This is the joyful temperament. This is the one that, well, let me just go through the list rather than me giving you my viewpoint on it because I could do it that way too, but it's better to give you the actual strengths. <coughs> Sanguine enjoys life, lively, spontaneous, enthusiastic, inspirational, loves to talk, optimistic, genuine, warm, sympathetic, approachable, likable, helpful, happy, 
and sincere. Those are the strengths of the sanguine. Now for the part most of us <laughs> really could have some issues with within ourselves or with others. The weaknesses of the sanguine are emotional, uninhibited, undisciplined, exaggerates, naive, unstable, <laughs> weak-willed, speaks before thinking, does not like to be alone, short attention span, changeable, forgetful, stubborn, superficial, and unreliable. So you have this joyful, happy, bouncy person, great with colors and, you know, just presents himself as very happy and, you know, talks too much, that kind of thing. But then you have the flip side of them that really can grate on your nerves, your own, if it's you personally or someone that you know. I found it interesting that on one, under the strengths, it says sincere, but then under the weaknesses, it says superficial. So it's a kind of incongruent. So it's one of those things where there's going to need to be some growth. So here's what the Sanguins make. Good actors, salesmen, and public speakers. Now I'm going to give you my own input with years of having thought about this and observed people and worked through it myself. When you get your hand out, it's going to have three asterisks. And this is Kitty's extra input that I didn't just get from one of the other author, authors, by the way, and I should have mentioned them. Tim LaHaye, Florence Litauer, and then Gary Smalley and John Trent are the people that I've got, gotten my information from. So the Sanguin, this is my input, has a great color memory, enters the room talking, they're relationship oriented, can be scatterbrained, they're present when they're with you, but you disappear when they walk away from you. I'll pray for you. And then they're on to the next person, completely invested in, they're really invested, they're not faking it, but they forgot they said they'd pray for you because they're on to the next relational opportunity. Again, relational oriented. And not to the degree that their productivity can suffer. They, they're upbeat and they have an upfront presence, but they often don't get a whole lot done. They forget things. It's a little bit helter-skelter. They're not negative. The sand one smiles a lot. In fact, it's almost a non-stop smile. And when you see that in my face, that's only 10% of who I am, but it's enough that it countered the rest of my temperament, which you'll find out for, for looks, because we're going to talk about looks. And that's what you can notice with the sand when they smile a lot. Now, again, keep in mind that depends on how much sand when they are. They can have 10% like I do, or they can have 50%, 80%, whatever. And so these things are going to stand out more in a person that's more sanguine, right? That seems obvious. So it also seems obvious that they're an extrovert. Sanguines are extroverted. Now, from Gary Smalley and John Trent, the type of animal, it, it helps to look at the type of animal that represents that temperament. And they chose the otter. Playful, fun. You never see otters being serious about much, right? They're just giddy and silly, and that's just their nature. So the otter is the animal type. A visual example from me is that they're most like the jack in the box. <laughs> Ta-da! Here I am! I like attention. Give me as much attention as possible. And 
they draw people to that because they're fun. Sad ones are fun. They're, they're all about fun, actually. <laughs> That's their big thing. Is it fun? And they're not the studious type. So if you have particularly a lot of sand when that may answer some questions for you. Okay, and also the facial expression I mentioned, smiling, upbeat. You can tell it in their facial structure that they're a sand when. Even if they're not smiling, you can see it in their facial structure. Just the way that their face is from years of smiling, you have a different face than if you were downcast. Now, I also want to talk about if, if this particular temperament is pushed, in other words, you're challenging them, they're going to react differently. And if you challenge a sanguine, they have enough insecurity that they may start waffling. Oh, because they want to please everybody? So, you didn't like what I said, well, maybe I can adjust that. <laughs> they're not really strong. They're, if they're pushed or if they're challenged, they will just kind of give a little bit rather than really standing for what they fully believe. So that's our sanguine. The next one we want to talk about is the melancholy. This is one of the richest, in fact, I think it is the richest of the temperaments. And we'll go through the strengths on this. Oh, how much on the sanguine? Hopefully you're figuring out your percentages, but did anyone particularly score high in sanguine here? Okay. Good. So that's helpful. When you maybe you'll be able to narrow it down to percentages sometime in the future. You can't necessarily do that right away. And it also the factor of are you being honest with, <laughs> with yourself? Okay, so the melancholy, the strengths of the melancholy are analytical, perfectionist. Now, by that we mean orderly. Their socks are all nicely in a row. <coughs> Their undershorts are all nicely in stacks and piles. And their work area is always neat and tidy. They clean up as they go. <laughs> Sandwins, excuse me, melancholies are sensitive. Aesthetic, everybody knows what that word means. They love beauty. They're, they're really blessed by beauty in nature, um, music, those kind of things. Thorough, the melancholy doesn't do anything part way. And of course, this is if you're predominant melancholy. Gifted, more gifted than they know usually because they tend to be down on themselves. Loyal, dependable, very time conscious. What's priority, and then second priority, third priority, just, they, they're very good at that. Love the fine arts. Now the weaknesses in the melancholy. Idealistic introspective, moody, critical, jealous, pessimistic, easily depressed, lonely, yearning, self-centered, and revengeful. Sounds like a great person to be around, doesn't it? The melancholy is more prone to depression than any of the other temperaments because it's in their DNA to be all the, you know, keeping their ducks in a, in a perpetual row and analyzing everything. They tend to be artists, musicians, inventors, philosophers, educators, and theoreticians. Hope I said that right. The melancholy, as you probably have figured out, is task-oriented, not relationship-oriented. 
They brood as they create. Again, this is my personal input over time and from things I've read. They love problem solving and are exceptionally good at it. Strongly melancholy people are not willing to share their feelings and depending on the rest of their blend, tend to be antisocial. Preferring to be alone. If they also have choleric in their blend, they can be explosive. <laughs> vehemently expressing their negativity and anger. So that's if it's a choleric melancholy and you don't have the other ones to buffer. Don't have the sanguine to buffer, don't have the phlegmatic to buffer. This person can be explosive. And I would say that would be the blend that would be revengeful as well. So, the, the thing about the melancholy is they, they, are, they internalize everything so much that it's destructive. Internally destructive. Because they have, they're, they're not only judgmental in their weaknesses of other people, but they're so judgmental of themselves. And so that is very, um, when you see a melancholy person on the street, at church, anywhere, if you know what to look for in their face, you'll be able to see that they're melancholy. So here's what you get when it's a strongly melancholy person. They're going to have lines that they look sad. The lines that develop in their face are not like the sanguine, the, the happy face. The melancholy doesn't smile very much. Sometimes not at all. Um, lines around, the, they just, they're not approachable. And they are an introvert to begin with. So the face kind of backs up that desire to be not involved with other people. I am 40% sanguine, excuse me, melancholy, 10% sanguine, 40% melancholy. Animal type, the beaver. A visual example, a detective. It energizes them to dig out and solve. That's fun. I love to problem solve and not just for myself but for others and it's just fun I, I enjoy it and as I said I'm 40% melancholy so thank God I'm not more <laughs> melancholy because a strong strong melancholy choleric which is my other is dour if they're choleric melancholy and they don't have the others to balance it out they're they're going to look real they just don't have a a look that makes you want to talk to them or be a sour and dour match because <laughs> that's kind of if it's a choleric melancholy then that's what you're going to see in their face so the the look on their face is serious frown lines and they just flat out look unhappy that's the melancholy temperament and that's okay that's the thing I want you to get in all of this it's okay and be yourself. Whoever you are, be yourself. So if you push a melancholy or challenge a melancholy, if you are right, they're going to brood because they didn't have it figured out. But if you're not right, then they're going to solve it and, and let you know that they solved it. It's important to them to get to the bottom of things. So again, the detective, detective. They're not easygoing, they're not upbeat, they're internally intense. Here's what my husband said, and he was, uh, let's see, he was 60% um, no, 70% melancholy, 10% choleric, and 10% phlegmatic, if that adds up to 100%. And so here's what he used to say, because he had this witty sense of humor, and he was loved to tease, and he's, he was just kind of, um, he liked to get reactions out of people. So he, what he would say is, my spiritual gift 
is the gift of criticism. <laughs> but he was not joking. <laughs> he really was good at, at being that way. We, I had to temper him a lot through our marriage because that would come out and he'd shoot me down, you know, on things. And, and I needed to be listened to, I needed to be heard, and not, this is the plan, but this is what's wrong with the plan. You know, and then you just give up. If, if you didn't understand what was in operation, you might just give up. So, so who scored high in the melancholy? Don't be shy. Okay. And figure out your percentages later, but this should help you a lot when you recognize it's built into you. It's God-given. Because it, it seems, you know, when I teach about it, it seems like it's the most negative of the temperaments, but it's the richest. It's the richest. These are the, these people are the backbone of getting stuff done and putting things together and planning and, you know, all of that. So it's a fabulous temperament to have, but it can also be hard to accept. It can be hard to accept in others, and it can be hard to accept in yourself. Especially if you have someone pointing out your weaknesses. <laughs> okay, so that's it on the melancholy. Leric. Choleric. Which do you prefer? Choleric. <laughs> We're going to go with choleric. Okay, the strengths of the choleric are aggressive slash assertive. Now, I like to say this about aggression, aggression versus assertive. I don't think aggression is healthy. Assertive is healthy. So you kind of have to have the balance between those. And literally, it was written down as a strength. Aggression is written as a strength. And I thought, you know, that's, I can't totally agree with that being a strength. I think it should be over in the weaknesses, and then the strengths should be assertive. So that's not on your handout. You might want to add that. Okay, so first strength in the choleric is aggressive or assertive, leader, strong-willed, practical, independent, determined, keen mind, activist, goal conscious, opportunist, fearless, hard driving. Those are the strengths of the choleric. Now you're going to love the weaknesses. This is what I fought against. Because I didn't like it. Harsh. Proud. Explosive. Inconsiderate. Self-sufficient. Makes rash decisions. Domineering. Impetuous. Offensive. Opinionated expresses anger, cruel, and antisocial. Lovely person. <laughs> but keep in mind, when we're Christians, we're going to learn to walk in the strengths and temper the weaknesses. I didn't like most of those. And I am 50% choleric. So 50, 40, 10. That's my temperament blend. So what do they make good? They're good executives, producers, builders, dictators, or criminals depending on their moral standards. <laughs> and I added to this list teachers because they do make really good teachers. But I've seen a lot of clerics that they don't listen. And these are things I'm adding as observations along the way. Let's see if I can put my foot up here. Um, I was listening to one of the radio shows today, The Narrow Path, whose name is Steve something or other. And he has people calling in. They ask their question and they do not get to speak again. He goes into, and it's all good, but I recognize it's choleric. He's a choleric melancholy, and if they try to talk, he talks over them. And I do that, don't I, Susie? 
<laughs> Sometimes I just, I'm so, I'm like a, well, I use the bulldozer as a, an example of the choleric temperament, but that's because the choleric temperament gets so much done in a pretty short amount of time. Like when they're on it, they're on it, and they're, they stick with it, like, that's a other good example. But the bulldozer isn't necessarily to mow people down, however, they are very capable of mowing people down. And, again, talking over people or not listening well to other people. So, here are some observations from my life as a choleric. And my, I wanted to be more melancholy than choleric. And my husband corrected me. He said, no. You are 50-40, not the reverse of that. So cholerics make... Oh, I told you that part. Okay, so here are some traits, some additional traits. Lightning fast mind. Task-oriented. Again, they're task-oriented rather than relationally oriented. Two of the temperaments are relationally oriented. They're more into being closer to other people and, you know, social interaction, that kind of thing. But the choleric is not that way. The choleric, it's goals, it's plans, it's let's get it done. And I've often seen cholerics, they're so sure that they're right, they just make stupid, a stupid decision because they overlooked something. I see this in someone close to me. I'm not going to name any names, but mm -hmm. he is so intelligent and so smart and so choleric that he just, there are certain things he just simply does not see that are um, skip details that should have been, should have been caught. So it's just moving too fast. They're the best people to have around in a disaster because it's innate to cholerics to know what to do. If there's an earthquake, they immediately will be the person to rise to the top and take charge and help other people to be taken care of. It's just natural. They don't even think about it. They just naturally go to the leadership role in a crisis, in a disaster. A predominantly choleric melancholy, as I said earlier, will be dour. Having a percentage of either sanguine or phlegmatic will balance that out. And thank God, because otherwise they're just, yeah, it's just hard to be around <laughs> someone that is strongly choleric melancholy. The animal type for the choleric, can you guess? The lion. The lion. Powerful. Decisive. Jump on it! The visual example, as I said earlier, is the bulldozer because they get lots done quickly. And if you challenge a choleric, they may verbally shred you. Or prove you wrong if you are. Or not admit it if you aren't. Or if they aren't. If they're the one that's wrong, they don't like to admit it. That's where the problem comes in. The facial expression on a choleric, set jaw, firm look to the face, confident, determined. You can see it in the face. You can tell, you can learn to tell. Now, I'm not telling you to put people in a box. Please don't get me wrong. But you can get a feeling of people pretty quickly. Whom, whom you're drawn to, whom you're not drawn to. And certain temperaments are drawn to other certain temperaments. It's, it's quite predictable, actually. Because a choleric marries another choleric. <laughs> going to have a lot of fireworks. If they're both strongly choleric, going to have a lot of fireworks. So there has to be something in there that uh, balances things out, tempers things down. The choleric is an extrovert. One thing about cholerics, they don't look tentative. They never look like they don't know what they're doing, unless they're getting really old. 
I'm starting to notice that. <laughs> starting to look a little more tentative about things. <clears throat> so, that is the choleric temperament. The very, again, add this to your list, very time conscious. And our last temperament, I'm sorry that I almost neglected this one, the phlegmatic. The phlegmatic strengths are even-tempered, relaxed, pleasant, efficient, balanced, dependable, kind-hearted, peace-loving, witty, practical, and consistent. The weaknesses in the phlegmatic slow moving, indolent, unmotivated, uninvolved, lazy, indifferent, teased. Remember earlier I talked about my husband, that was his 10% phlegmatic that he was teasing. Stubborn, indecisive, complacent, and unexcited. This is the, the one I think of for this as a visual is a tranquilizer. This person, <laughs> when they're in the room, they're going to bring this sense of calm with them. Their facial expressions don't change a lot. In fact, they intentionally will not show facial expressions because they don't want you to know what they're thinking or feeling. So they're they're often just a non, no smile, no frown, just, what would I call that? What's a good word for that? I guess it goes along with being complacent. They look complacent. Game face. Hmm? Game face. Game face. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. They like others to decide. My friends always have a pretty good share of phlegmatic. You can probably guess why. Because I am so strongly melancholy cleric. So I will say to one of my friends, where would you like to go? And guess what they answer? I don't care. I don't care. We're, whatever you want to do. And they really mean it. They mean it. They're not just being lazy about deciding where you're going to go or what you're going to do. They honestly don't care. They're comfortable with other people making decisions. And they, they will choose friends that are good at making decisions. So let's go over what they're good at. And some of these are a little bit surprising to me. The first one certainly isn't. A good diplomat. Definitely, I would... An accountant? Yep. But leader. And I kind of tripped on that a little bit. But you know, if you really think about it, we need leaders that are not pushy, shovey, opinionated, you know, they bring the tranquilizer to the room kind of thing. They're good scientists, and they enjoy meticulous work, which is also a little bit surprising to me. So here are some of my observations on the phlegmatic. Phlegmatics are observers. They struggle with productivity and time consciousness. This is the person that's always late, along with the sanguine. Those are the two that are the late. They're late. They will extend conversations which may contain lots of fluff just because they're enjoying the social interaction. So they talk and talk and talk and you're going, <coughs> you can go sometimes like, what's the value in this conversation? As a choleric melancholy, that's unfortunately what I might think is, you know, it's really a waste of time. But in reality, that's who they are and they also need to be heard. And so, yes, we may want to temper that a little bit, but they also avoid productivity. So the talking too much or that kind of thing or just not getting into it is because they're avoiding, it's avoidance behavior. They're avoiding 
doing what they need to get done. They're prone to having a cluttered environment. They rarely host events in their home. They tend not to finish projects. And here's the thing that it's funny and it's not funny with the phlegmatic. They love to take a sanguine or choleric in their joy and their enthusiasm and just dump a nice cup of cold water right on their head. They like to deflate people. It's, it's, that's the only thing I can think of is it's a desire to, it's a way to tease, but it's also a way to get a reaction. You know, you take someone that's really hyped up and they're excited about what they're doing and you do something that really brings them down. That's something phlegmatics love to do. Odd, from my perspective, but it isn't to them. It's just their natural way of being. They prefer a slow-moving environment. Again, they calm the atmosphere. Phlegmatics are also good listeners. They're good talkers, but they're also good listeners, and they love to tease. And that's kind of the pouring cold water on. That can be a tease as well. I'm pretty well this way or that way. I'm not neutral on very many things. But the phlegmatic is, and it's a blessing because it does calm things down. If not understood and validated within one's temperament blend, Temperament and conflict will prevent accomplishments and productivity. So if a person has this in their temperament and they have melancholy or they have choleric, you can have a fight going on. Dragging them along, you know, drag that phlegmatic along. You're going to do what I want you to do kind of thing. And the more you do that, the more they will dig their heels in. That's the way phlegmatics are. You challenge them, they're going to dig their heels in and they're going to show you they're not going to do what you want. The phlegmatic is introverted, and I love the animal that was chosen for this. <laughs> the golden retriever. What more pleasant dog is there than a golden retriever? Just sweet and gentle and fits in and doesn't raise a bunch of ruckus like a lot of the other dog breeds. So it's a perfect animal representation of the phlegmatic. My visual example, I already told you, most like a tranquilizer. A, a phlegmatic can tend to be passive aggressive. So they may do what you want them to do at the time, even though they resent it and they don't want to do it. But they're going to sneak around somehow. They, that's one of the traits that's not on your list, but sneakiness, yeah. They're going to come back around and they're going to get you one way or another if you push them and you try to force them to do what you want them to do. So if you, if you have a phlegmatic or you are a phlegmatic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you live with a phlegmatic, don't push them. You just have to let them be. I see heads shaking. It's like, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so the facial expression I already said, it's very little facial expression, non-responsive. You know, as a teacher, when there's a strong phlegmatic in the room, they usually won't give me the cues that the other temperaments will give me of response. They just sit there stoic because they don't want me to know what's going on in their head. They neither smile nor frown. It's like, I don't want to give myself away. So... I'll just sit here and not react, and then you won't know that you got to me, or that what you said mattered. It's a, I guess that's kind of a control thing too, if I think about it that way. So, here's some important notes on the sanguine, excuse me, the phlegmatic. But the sanguine and or phlegmatic temperament traits are the traits that soften the hard edges of the melancholy and the choleric. We need sanguine and we need phlegmatic to soften those hard edges that can otherwise be there. While the melancholy and the choleric either motivate or condemn, 
the sanguine or the phlegmatic temperaments within themselves and within others, if the person does not understand that their temperament blend has these different components in them, then the traits are not going to be working synergistically. And that's what we're trying to do. If you have, if you have a temperament that you didn't like hearing about, it may be your smallest one, it may be your biggest one. But if you react to that and don't let it function, don't understand its needs. See, that's the thing. Each of your temperament blend. I, I sound like I'm talking about four different people, but I'm not. It's a blend of a person that each part has needs. And when those needs aren't met, each one is going to have a reaction against the rest of you. So this is what I mean when I say temperaments in conflict. Accepting you as you are, let yourself be, is so critical and so important. Synergistically, that's what we're going for. We're looking for synergy. So those are the four temperaments. And I want to add just a couple things to that that maybe kind of round it out a little bit more for you. Each of our temperament components react differently to trauma, neglect, abuse, and can be wrestling with you trying to be heard. That can often be what the wrestling match is about, just trying to be heard. Each trait, each component has something valid and important to tell you. Shifting your focus to begin paying attention is going to allow you to hear your internal reasoning. Each part of your temperament needs to be validated and also needs to be healed. Every part of you needs to be healed. And each part of your temperament was wounded at various stages in your upbringing or your life's experiences and need to be healed in order to move forward. Healthy self-parenting will allow you to heal and aspects of your temperament to become congruent with the rest of you. Isn't Think about that. Think about being content with all that you are and functioning in that and finding the giftedness that God has put in there. Because we haven't talked about spiritual gifts. But those spiritual gifts are going to flow through your temperament. And so when you get everything functioning together congruently, less stress, much less stress. And not understanding all this is, is a, going to be a forerunner to depression and anxiety. That's the underlying thing in my desire for teaching you this. If you are not congruent with your temperament, you're going to have an underlying anxiety, fear, depression, that can be alleviated when you accept and work with yourself. So do you see that learning about yourself is important? About your temperament? Why? Why is that? Accept parts of yourself that you have either not recognized or have been rejecting. Learning my temperament was major for growing into my gifts. Because if I kept wearing the sanguine mask, that was a lot of stress. Do you see the contrast of the sanguine, happy, upbeat, easygoing, outgoing person that is totally juxtaposed to the melancholy choleric? And yet I was living as if that was completely me, unknowing that in order to do that, I had to snuff out. I had to literally snuff out other traits. And it was exhausting. It's exhausting to not know your temperament. And so this is part of my mission in life, is to teach as many people as I can 
about this critical topic so that you can get comfortable with who you are and begin to accept others and accept yourself. So I hope this has been helpful to you tonight. So as you sit this next couple of weeks and think about this prayerfully, Lord, help me to see what I've been rejecting about myself or rejecting in my mate or my children. You know, your children are not going to be the same blend as you are. Or they may be the same blend as you are. And that may be irritating. I often say in a household, and I think this is, well, I know this is the reason why I grew up with a sanguine mask, there can only be one choleric woman in the household that is allowed to be a cleric, and I say female, or even if it's a dad. So another child that is strong in that temperament will be kind of taught to be quiet, taught something different than what they really are. And that's exactly what happened to me because my mother was very cleric, cleric melancholy, and very much the same temperament I am. But it caused me to go into subterfuge with a lot of what I really am because I had to stay under the radar. And since that was the case, it, I had to grow up. I had to figure out who I was and let myself be who I am with the Lord's help and heal and praise God, you know. And it's just a fact that choleric men or women can really be a bulldozer is a good word <laughs> but they can be too too decisive too opinionated too um, if they don't have something if they don't understand their temperament first of all they can really be um, difficult to be around so this is critical that you learn these things about yourself, your mate. Very important that you understand your mate. And you're going to find things that will be surprising. So, so God bless you as you investigate this more deeply. And this is one of the most fascinating topics that, that I've taught on. It's just critical. It's critical to your, to your future and to your to your life and to your ministry, whatever that might end up being. Because I don't know what you're going to end up doing in your life. But I know that if you don't understand your temperament, you've been blocking it. So we want you to unblock. So we're going to close in prayer. So Lord, we thank you tonight for this information. We thank you for bringing it to us in a way that we can comprehend and understand. Thank you for Hippocrates who originally came up with this whole concept of temperaments and Tim LaHaye and Florence Litauer and John Trent and Gary Smalley, how they have enlightened us and taught us so that we can figure out who we are, so that we can bless others, bless ourselves, bless others in ministry and be functional, be completely functional. Help us Lord. Help us to do it. And help us to be honest as we look at these traits, some of them that are so hard to swallow that we don't want to say, oh yeah, I have that trait. But it is part of the temperament and the weaknesses are part of our temperament blend. So help us, Lord, with that. Help us to be honest with you, honest with ourselves, and honest with everyone in our realm of influence. So we give you praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.